Okay, so uh, welcome to session six. We are starting today with Clara kleininger Vanik. She is an anthropologist and filmmaker and is lecturing in documentary and anthropology at the University of Opole, Poland, and is a PhD candidate in film by practice at the University of Exeter. Clara's talk is on exploring indigenous views on interspecies relations in the Chacawa Lagoon, Mexico through documentary. Just before you start, Clara, if I could just say, we're gonna stick with the format where we have all the questions at the end. Um, please keep checking the Padlet and add questions there if you would like to. Okay, thank you. Over to you, Clara. Okay, thank you very much. I will share my screen. Hello, so um, I will present my PhD research and I'm starting the second year now and I will start field work in October, so it is uh, still fair, fairly early on. My project uses participatory ethnographic filmmaking to represent human more than human relationships in the Chacawa Lagoon. That's on the southwest coast, on the Pacific coast of Mexico. And um, my aim is to approach ecological and social critique uh, through indigenous thinking. My interest started from anthropological descriptions of how ontologies uh, making sense of humans place in the environment, including ideas on what is human and more than human and what humans and more than humans being sh beings share are culturally, culturally varied. Um, um, I found also that there is a lack of documentary film projects which attempt to represent multi-species relations and indigenous ontologies on film. Um, especially such that employ collaborative filmmaking methods as I plan to, and little literature that reflects on how film form can work towards visual representations of multi-species ethnographies. Um, so through research by practice, I will make a participatory documentary film um, through collaboration in the spirit of uh, Jean Rouge's shared anthropology. Um, and which in which I will aim to show the lagoon as an essentially interconnected environment, um, matrix of human and more than human interdependence. The film also should challenge human exceptionalism and a nature culture divide um, and give space on screen to both human and more than human uh, inhabitants of the lagoon. Um, just a little bit more context. So the Chacawa Pastoria Lagoons are on the Western coast of Mexico. The lagoon has been declared a national park in 1937. Um, so quite a while ago, but a range of damaging activities are still carried out close by. Um, so, um, Metzli Rodriguez Aguilera, who, who researched there, describes the lagoon as sentient and the inhabitants of the lagoon as having a relationship that deeply represents the physical, emotional, social, and political connectivity between humans and non-humans in Mexico's geography. And the lagoon is home to a variety of birds, fish, shrimps, mussels, and as you can see, also crocodiles. Uh, and according to Rodriguez Aguilera, is experiencing an, an ecocide conservation efforts in the area, rather than include and support um, the Afro-Mexican and indigenous population as important actors and carriers of knowledge, uh, rather enforce racism and dispossession in continuation of, of former colonial politics. So my research uh, aims to be a visual multi-species ethnography. Um, and like a multi-species ethnography aims for, starts from the premise that human lives should not be described as separate from other living beings, but instead the most fruitful descriptions result from mapping the points of connection. Uh, anthropologist Eduardo Kohn points out that for too long anthropology has focused only on attributes that are distinctive to humans uh, and therefore forcefully cut off the connection with the rest of the world in its descriptions. Um, so uh, Anna Tsing, the author of another multi-species ethnography, The Mushroom at the End of the World, advocates for an art of inclusion uh, to better describe the entangled relations between humans and more than humans. I will spend the next academic year, starting October in Chacawa, doing 
field work, shooting the film and starting to edit. So as to allow for feedback screenings and discussions. Uh, but as I am before field work, what I want to discuss today are some thoughts on how film can address the more than human world. Uh, okay. Uh, and um, here are uh, some things that um, I want to express with my film or some ideas that I will use to, to construct the film. So. Um, one more uh, multi-species ethnography is this Laura Ogden's um, Swamp Life. And uh, Laura Ogden uses uh, Deleuze and Guattari's idea of rhizo rhizomatic thinking um, to describe the more than human relationships she encounters in the swampy Florida Everglades. Uh, the rhizome shifts focus to recognizing and not reducing multiplicity and to um, non-hierarchical kind of connections. And through the rhizome, Ogden explains how the swamp landscape does not contain and is transformed by the human world, but only comes into being in all its dimensions, material, semiotic, human, and non-human, through relations without finality. And here's a visual representation of the rhizome. It's a, it's a drawing by Richard Giblet. Um, another thing that interests me are different points of view. Um, so per perspectivism is a term coined by the anthropologist Viveros de Castro. In Amazonian understanding, um, all living beings he describes share uh, sociability and an inner world, uh, but they are differentiated by, the, by their bodies, which is uh, rather the opposite of uh, Descartes' proposition and how the Western world is used to conceptualize difference and similarities, rather in our bodies and denying um, um, an inner world that is similar. Um, so the willingness and ability to take on the other's perspective can, in the most straightforward way, be attempted through intentional use of the point of view of the camera. Uh, the camera is a privileged uh, medium for playing with perspective, as cinema usually shows us the world from one situated perspective as, at a time. In practice, this means a play on who is the onlooker and who is looked at, and how each of these perspectives is framed. Um, Another uh, point that is important for me is animacy. I search for a cinematography intended to highlight the shared animacy of not just human and more than human animals and plants, but also natural phenomena through color, texture, close-ups, and durations that allow for attention to detail and sensoriality. Um, okay. So here are some uh, elements uh, I'm considering uh, that are necessary to achieve some of this with some examples. Um, so sensoriality, looking back is not all more than human beings do and we do uh, for, the, for that matter. The senses we and others use to interact and communicate are not reduced to the visual, but extend to hearing back, smelling back, tasting back and touching back. So sensoriality um, is important in communicating this, and it is present in films uh, that are somehow connected to the sensory ethnography lab. Um, Faye Ginsberg uh, describes uh, some of the sensory ethnography lab's films, such as Leviathan, which there's a screenshot here on the top left, and Sweetgrass as able to shift the focus from people to an assemblage of species and natural elements through re refocusing from language and verbal explanation to sensory immersion uh, by way of images and sounds. A Leviathan is a 2012 film uh, by Lucien Castain Taylor and Verena Paravel which uh, is filmed on a fishing trawler and it pushes perspective uh, beyond regular human perception, brings the camera into untypical points of view, such as high above the mast of the ship, uh, as well as moving with the fishing nets in and out of water, and so creates an immersive experience of being there. Um, Looking at time uh, on screen for on-screen depiction of, of more than human worlds is also important. Um, and Laura McMahon argues that a certain approach to screen time makes a difference for connecting to another being's experience. She criticizes a recurring invocation of the animal in animality in general in philosophy as entirely detached from the realities of particular more than human lives and subjectivities. So to counter these failures of representing real subjects, uh, McMahon stresses the potential of time. 
she calls it slow animal cinema, which uses dead time to sharpen our attentiveness to material and embodied animal life. Um, McMahon also criticizes Leviathan, on the other hand, as a failed attempt at entering these animal worlds of perception and meaning making. Um, the film uh, fails to attend to animal death on film from a perspective of biopolitics. It con contains no commentary at all. Uh, the viewer is just placed there. Um, and the long takes of the film are um, shaky and agitated and don't achieve an opening up um, of animal worlds as, as she conceptualizes. Another uh, film connected to sensory ethnography is El Mar La Mar. Um, the directors are Joshua Bonetta and J.P. Chniadecki, and it was filmed in the Sonoran Desert, which spans across the U.S.-Mexican border. And it starts, the, the director started from an investigation um, of many migrants who have died um, attempting to cross the desert, but it extends um, to offering a vivid impression of what it feels like to be in the desert and with all its inhabitants. Uh, both images and sound work towards extending this presence to more than human life. The film's sound design immerses in a world dominated by the desert wind, but not at all devoid of life. It teems with the sound of more than human and human animals at night. Insects buzzing, crackling Spanish-speaking voices transmitted over the radio, dogs barking, the sound of steps. Residents, including more than human ones and travelers, are observed as exposed to and interacting with the elements and landscape, described by the filmmakers as a more efficient barrier than a border fence. Um, so animacy um, also means ongoing change through movement, growth, and death. And uh, um, this is the last film I, I will talk about is Michelangelo from Martino's The Quattro Volte. The titles Quattro Volte are a reference to Pythagoras' four terms, uh, the process of soul transmigration, which includes the human, animal, vegetable, and mineral realms in equal measure. Um, the long time frames of the film and lack of narration and dialogue, again, so um, this recurs, are structured by movement through the seasons, marked by village uh, celebrations and an attention to the, to the more than human. Uh, the soundscape, almost entirely devoid of human speech, makes space for all other sounds and more than human beings and elements. Um, more than human agency and, and interaction are prioritized uh, through an unmoving camera and very long shots. And um, finally, I just want to shortly mention a project that is not a film, but an interactive website, which uh, many of you might know. Uh, so it's Feral Atlas, which uh, here you can see the creators. Uh, among them is also Anna Tink, who I mentioned before. Feral Atlas makes full use of the nonlinear potential of the digital uh, to map out what the authors call feral interactions. Um, interactions defined as not planned and designed within imperial and in industrial infrastructure, but somehow uh, encouraged by these. Uh, so the Anthropocene uh, run wild. Um, Feral Atlas points out unexpected consequences and influences of both human and non-human action uh, and focuses attention on the connections between the Anthropocene, not as an earth-wide process, but as a, they call it, patchy Anthropocene differentiated into privileged and vulnerable spaces, highlighting the inequalities embedded in it. The way Feral Atlas traces big scale processes uh, with attention to local locality is a good example for me in my own field side, which is with its entangled post-colonial industrial and touristic contexts. Um, the intention, unintentional consequences, feral as they call them of the Anthropocene are everywhere. Uh, in Chakawa, the desire to improve upon the lagoon resulted in such unintentional consequences. As a lagoon, uh, it was connected to the ocean and had an inflow of oxygen, uh, but a breakwater supposed to stabilize it was built by the federal government in 1972 and two more in the 2000s. And uh, now the canal connecting the lagoon to the ocean um, has filled up with sand and uh, there is no inflow of oxygen. So the lagoon um, and all its uh, inhabitants suffer from this. Um, both human and more than human inhabitants um, feel illness and uh, experience death in the lagoon. Um, all right. 
So, um, I find it remains problematic to claim that through specific framing and rhythm, film can entirely convey what a non-human being perceives the world as. But while it is not possible to fully immerse a viewer in another another's perspective and experience of the world, I think it is important to draw attention to the fact that the world is being seen and experienced by more than human others all the time, and we are being experienced too as humans. Um, Anthropologist Eduardo, Eduardo Kohn's program of focusing on the points of interaction between human and more than human actors can be enacted in filmic form uh, through a play with a uh, point of view, with perspective, and the camera that refuses to privilege the human actors um, over others, uh, more than human animals, natural elements or features of the landscape can make a step towards this. Filmic time and attention to sensoriality can center the presence of the more than human in film. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Clara. That was really fascinating. I really love this idea of using film to get different perspectives and different perspectives on how non-human animals perceive time as well. It's really fascinating. I would definitely be checking out Feral Atlas. I've not heard of that before. Um, if you have questions for Clara, if you could put them in the Padlet or at the end, feel free to raise your hand when we get through the other two talks. So we'll move on now to Susanna Valenska. Susanna is a PhD researcher of historical sociology at Faculty of Humanities, Charles University in Prague and has been working on a dissertation project concerning cognitive, emotional and attitude changes in human relationships towards non-human animals. Susanna will be talking to us on augmentative interspecific communication, AIC, from zoosemiotic perspective, perspectives of canine human communication via talking buttons. Thank you, Susanna. Hi, uh, so I will start sharing my screen. So this contribution puts reflections uh, on the issue of interspecies uh, species communication between human and dogs. Uh, it employs an interdisciplinary approach to understanding and intersemiotic translation between human and animals, uh, especially in the case of domestic or companion animals, which have adapted to human animal communication so far. Uh, although most dog uh, owners can interpret the dog's messages quite accurately, they uh, cannot be sure why the dog is sad, for example, uh, where is he hurting or of who he misses. Although uh, dogs can understand many different words from human, they are no longer able to give a response to that extent with uh, their limited means of expression. Talking buttons are a form of augmentative uh, interspecies um, communication devices, uh, which aim to help non-human animals communicate in language like ways. Although dogs uh, and other animals can understand the words we say, uh, they can um, uh, they can actually um, uh, speak uh, with words uh, too. So throughout the history of domestication, uh, dogs have undergone a process of adaptation to communicate and interact with humans, which may have contributed to the development of their cognitive resources. Dogs can produce specific calls with distinct meanings. They might be also capable of combining multiple meaningful calls into syntactically ordered sequences. Communication with the motive to inform others has been seen in, as a unique feature of a human communication so far. Uh, thanks to modern technologies, uh, heterospecific communication between dog and human is um, yet more accessible for everyone. Studying human-dog interspecies communication can, can give us a better understanding not only of dogs, but also of the way humans communicate. Syntax, that is uh, rules for combining words or elements, and semantics, that is meaning of expressions, are two pivotal features of a human language. And interaction between them allows us to generate a limitless number of meaningful expressions. Um, while both features were uh, traditionally thought to be unique to human language, researchers uh, over the past four decades have revealed intriguing parallels in uh, animal communication systems. Many birds and mammals produce specific calls with distinct meanings, and some species combine multiple meaningful calls into syntactically ordered sequences. 
Dogs have a vast and flexible repertoire of visual, acoustic, and olfactory signals that allow an expressive uh, and fine-tuned conspecific communication. Dogs use this behavioral repertoire uh, when communicating with humans, employing the same signals uh, used during conspecific interactions, some of which can acquire and carry a different meaning when directed toward humans. Dogs use their whole, whole body to communicate and conveying information intentionally or otherwise. Dogs are also significantly engaged in visual communication by modifying different parts of their body, in tactile communication and in auditory and olfactory communication with vocalizations or body odors. Dogs' uh, readiness to receive and act on human communication may have its roots in uh, their relatively uh, long evolutionary history alongside humans. In some respects, those dogs have um, even outpaced other species, including apes and non-domesticated canids. For example, the dog is the only animal able to follow the indication of the object. Uh, dogs' skill uh, in comprehending human cooperative signals raises the question of whether they are also able to produce such a cooperative signals flexibly. Um, there is evidence that dogs uh, produce context-specific barks which humans can classify even if they are naive to interactions with dogs. I will show you now um, first example of the communication via the talking buttons. There is a pool outside and the dog doesn't know the name of pool. So he says outside singing water. Sorry. This dog wants to invite some concrete person to come over. And last one, I will show you now. Um, so, uh, I would like to talk about zoosemiotics now. In the light of its most recent developments, zoosemiotics can be defined uh, as the study of signification, communication, and representation within and across animal species. The focus of soma zoosemiotics is not simply communication, but rather starts from semiosis, uh, following Charles Morris, and the process in which something is assigned to some uh, organism and involves every single process of production, exchange, and interpretation of signs. Communication, that is the process in which a sign is coded and transmitted from a sender to a receiver, uh, in this case from a dog to a human or vice versa, is thus to be considered just uh, one among many uh, processes of this kind, albeit an important one. So semiotics is interested also in the phenomenon of signification occurring when the receiver is the only subject involved and true sender is missing. In other words, zoosemiotics are uh, also studies the ways animals uh, make sense of their environment and other animals. Um, by code is meant everything that the source and the receiver know a priori about the message. Sibiok uh, discussed Lotman's typology of sign systems and argued for the existence of primary modeling systems uh, as those 
of the prolinguistic or nonverbal ones. Um, a word is a form uh, modeling reality in a specific way. In uh, the human species, forms uh, may uh, be purely imaginary, in uh, which case uh, they uh, are equivalent to mental images, or they, uh, they can be externalized in a material form into uh, representations such as signs, uh, words, gestures, texts, codes, language, music, figures, assemblage like metaphors, etc. Linguistic communication is one uh, of many expressive manifestations besides music, gesture, imaginary, uh, imagery. It cannot be understood, understood as meaning production without a deeper study of these underlying semantic properties uh, of the human mind and psyche. Uh, and um, it seems that a close relationship between the two creatures is needed to model the words and content that lead to such rich communicative exchanges between a man and dog that are we witnessing. Understanding the role of emotions is shaping the knowledge and behavior represents increasingly uh, important uh, part of studies of interspecific communication. Actually, it appears that increasing involvement into this specific type of interspecies communication can uh, be amplifying cognitive skills of domesticated species. So um, we can see uh, the board which uh, the dog can use is, uh, in this is fluent pet system, but there exist other uh, systems, uh, AIC. Uh, so animals have complex inner lives, curiosity, fear, excitement, boredom uh, are not restricted to humans. Animals uh, feel, many, uh, feel many of the same emotions that we do. So I will show you some other dog. This is Lexi. Lexi is, uh, really likes to come she likes to communicate. You will you will hear her voice as well. But, but not also dogs are capable of communicating by buttons. We can see horse. So I would like to go to next slide, but <laughs> according to videos, I'm not able to. <laughs> okay, I will show you the last one. Uh, actually, dogs uh, mostly communicate their emotions. So I usually they uh, use the buttons to communicate they uh, that they are missing some somebody. Okay, usually the closest persons.
Okay, it doesn't work. Hey, whatever. <laughs> so thank you very much. Here are the uh, searches. Thank you, Susanna. Talking buttons, a really interesting phenomenon. I have never seen them used with a horse before. And I was yeah. wondering whether someone was developing different input devices for different species that are maybe not so adept at yeah. using paws or their nose to touch buttons. It'll be really interesting to see how that develops. I can see there are questions already for Susanna. If you think of any others, um, please go to the Padlet and put them in. Uh, now we're going to move on to Marta Silva Munitz. Marta trained as a veterinarian in Brazil. She is a PhD candidate in biomedical science at Freie Universität Berlin and an undergraduate student in political science at Centro Universitario Ananguera Pythagoras Ampli. Marta's talk is entitled Of Mice and Me, Taking Ownership of Shared Animalities in the Lab. Thank you, Marta. Um, all right, so thanks for the introduction. Thanks for having me here. It's just such a such a pleasure to finally talk about the mice a little bit. Um, a few fair warnings. Uh, there will be graphic descriptions, but no no imagery, certainly not such nice imagery imagery as uh, the talking buttons. It's a hard one to follow. It threw me off my balance. <laughs> Um, but uh, there will be some name calling and general anger uh, beyond a bit of a scholarly um, putting together of my thoughts here. This is also the venting of a very, very tired PhD student. So bear with me. I'll try to hold back, but uh, I hope you forgive me if I can't. Um, I think the first thing that we need to understand in order to sort of understand the animalities in the lab is really how biomed understands itself as a community, right? So. Um, we're talking about a space here where critical reflection is not encouraged and, and most of the time also not welcome. So what we have is really what we have. It's a really realist capitalist approach <laughs> to um, to our methods. So if we have them and if they work so far, then they're all we have, right? And it's the best way possible. It's objective, it's rational, it's apolitical. And so we stick the Kantian ideas, the Cardian ideas of how to do science as the gold standard of how to produce knowledge right and um the way we when whenever you point in a, in, a, in a meeting of biomedical scientists in a room with biomedical scientists whenever you point at the, the, the problems within our sort of understanding of ourselves um there's a quick separation from what is good science and what is bad science right especially when you point at the failures of science in the past then they go like that that's not that's not us that's a completely different thing that's a completely different entity and there is this pervasive idea that what we do now as current scientists is good science and good science is distinguishable from bad science because it's completely in our minds it's completely separate from societal context and free of political narratives and again in lieu of um, historical awareness is also we also see it as free and separate from historical practice. So there's a sort of inherent barrier between us and the scientists of the past, right? So the way we see, the way we see things, the problems with science, how, how whatever scientific paper you get now and you point at problems at it, right? We're gonna find ways to point at the impurities with that science. So problems with science, even the ethical ones are usually blamed on the impurities of having those, those external narratives contaminating the pure science that you should otherwise be doing, right? And so the way we see us is the good scientists of the present, of the present doing high quality science in contrast to the, the bad scientists of the past doing low quality science. And so we conflate the idea of um, critical reflection with quality in really interesting ways. One of them is, of course, critical reflection. Supposedly, we have enough of it that we can distinguish ourselves from the scientists of the past, right? But also, we're not supposed to do anything beyond the checkboxing that the, the ethics committee recommended, because that would be a problem in and of itself. 
uh, because it inserts outside the discourses into the pure science. We're only supposed to be talking about science. And so that's that's how we see ourselves, for example, as fundamentally different people doing fundamentally different science from, for example, the people who did phrenology or the people who experimented on enslaved people. Um, let, let's let's completely ignore like the 70s and that experiments on uh, on people or incarcerated people and so on. This, this doesn't even sort of make the cut because it's not from knowledge. So not something you can bring up very easily. Um, but what what I've been finding very interesting is that you can point at even like the sort of gray area moments that science is living right now, but we don't consider. I mean, we check the, the, ethic committee, the ethics committee boxes, therefore we don't need to think any further, right? And so you can see, for example, this this was a technical breakthrough in 2019, like very recently, when uh, scientists in the UK used huge data sets to analyze human behavior. And they even explained up to 25% of same-size behavior um, with those genomic analysis. And there was there is zero pushback as 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 of now, there's zero sort of critical reflection on what that even means. Haven't we done that in the 70s? Is that really what we're supposed to be doing? Um, but again, the spirit here is to keep critical reflection away from the from biological spaces. Um, nature, surprisingly, has been doing a little bit of a job in that. Um, so they published this one in 2020. There's a few publications about addressing the lingering racism and disparities and the, the underlying colonial thinking that we use, um, even with a huge special issue just from last year about racism and science. But those, unfortunately, are really, it's, in my experience, I seem to be the only one aware of them most of the time, because most of us are heavily siloed not only from the humanities and social sciences but also from one another and so um, i do in my in my research i do genetic engineering and i would be only reading about genetic engineering and nothing else um yeah it's just this is just an illustration of uh, science magazine these are, are screenshots from science magazine that follow this really sort of uncritical way to portray science with this pi standing next to the huge data bank that he uses to explain human behavior as if there was absolutely nothing to be said about the ethics of that. Um, and so with that in mind, I hope you can understand how challenging challenging biomedical sort of underlying thinking of biomedical circles can be really challenging in, in and out of itself because, well, everyone thinks that their science is objective, is rational, is apolitical, is ahistorical, and it's objective. How dare you? So. And so whenever you point at all of these huge sort of uh, factors that are um, that are influencing the questions you ask, the data you choose, and so on, then they, well, they push back. The room turns on you. It's a whole thing. Um, and then they come, they, they gasp, <laughs> they become angry, and they throw all kinds of knee-jerk reactions at you. And those are all the ones I have heard so far. Are you against science? Do you, why are you giving fodder to anti-vax movements? Do you not care about the children? This is a pediatric research unit. You don't care about the link. <laughs> and uh, no one is actually willing to engage with the question of, should we look at history and try not to do that again? Right? And of course, there's the, the easiest cop-out ever. It's not my field, not my problem. I don't have to care about any of these because I don't know anything about them, nor do I want to learn. <laughs> the conversation is dead. Um, and uh, the way that the way that I have been personally observing that in terms of lab politics and everyday lab uh, lab politics is really this not a use of the duality animal human because that would be that would be anti ethical and black and white and then and then but what we can do is create lab politics that are based in a sort of stretching that that duality into a spectrum that goes from full humanness to full animality. And then a few archetypes are really clear to see in everyday discourse. Um, 
so you have the full humanness of the full scientist and the more scientist you are the more human you are the more agency you have right so i'm a scientist but not as much as a scientist as my pi who gets to dictate research agenda in the lab gets to um, shape our questions and our methods and so on but the closer you are to the scientist the more agency the more participation and the the more above ethical consideration you are. And I use above here very deliberately because you are in charge of ethical consideration and you decide whether you're going to consider something. And then um, closer to animality in the middle ground, we have the subject that would be normally, like statistically, that's marginalized groups that end up as a subject because they, they face way too many barriers to becoming a scientist, right? And they do have agency and warrant high level of, of ethical consideration, but their participation in advocacy can only happen as dictated by the scientists. And of course, for the animals, given our framework and the way we understand ourselves, all that's left is the position of an object with full animality. So there is no agency, they are no, they're granted no agency, no participation, and no ongoing advocacy past checking the boxes for the ethics committee. Ethical consideration is mostly seen as a bureaucratic hurdle. That's something most biomedical scientists will not tell you, but they will get readily annoyed if the, the ethics committee actually has any um, objections to their research. Then they get really annoyed. They, again, real life conversation. I just wish they weren't so pessimistic. They don't see that I'm reflecting about ethics. It's just that I want to do my research. So, yeah, and what we fail often to consider is that the who is who, again, it's not a historical, it's not a political, it's culturally and historically situated, right? Take me, for example, a woman from the inlands of Northeast Brazil, from one of the traditional communities of Northeast Brazil. Um, now I get to be here as a scientist, but Fast backwards 20 years, I would get to be here possibly as a scientist, but statistically not very likely. Fast forward um, 50 years, I would only be here as a subject. Fast forward 100 years, I might end up here as an object. Um, and so that that's that was a nice tweet that I'm gonna I'm gonna have to skip in the interest of time, but it really highlights the sort of understanding of um scientific figures as a political and a historical we tend to discuss you know newton and darwin and so on as people who are only defined by their science and they never had any politics um and that really culminates in a scenario of anti-intersectionality as I'm, I'm calling it now because i find that um calling it neglection or calling it neglect is it gives the scientists a bit too much of a benefit of the doubt when they are so actively invested in keeping intersectionality out and keeping any debate about social context out and calling it political or, or seeing it as a contamination of their science. So this is such an active process that I decided I'm not going to refer this as a lack of intersectionality when intersectionality is not allowed nor welcome. Um, and it really, um, it really highlights sort of this, this understanding that complexity, human complexity, social complexity don't belong in the room. It really highlights a sort of um, the practices of passive harm that we enact as a community, because there is also, again, the knee-jerk understanding that if I'm not planning to do harm, if I don't intend to do harm, then I'm not doing harm, right? And so when I argue that biomedical communities are doing harm also to human communities in this narrow-minded understanding of what they do, they tend to go, no, we're not doing any harm because we're not experiment on humans. We, don't not, we do not experiment on humans, right? Um, and then I came across this idea from Kilmer, from... Um, Braiding sweet grass when she has an entire chapter dedicated to collateral damage. And in her work, she talks about, for example, the frogs that don't get to cross the road because of the development that is encroaching on their society. And so I, I sort of took it as I translated it here as an idea of also passive harm, of also who is the collateral damage of current scientific practice, right? Who is being neglected? because neglect is also a form of harm. Um, and that was the question that inserted me into the conversation about the mice, because 
this uh, rejection of complexity, it really results in a sort of weaponized simplicity, right, in biomedical research, because we don't, we don't use female mice or female people because they're too complicated to have periods. We don't use um, people without homes or people with previous sickness or disability because they're too complicated. They have variables that interfere with your results. And so you can really see how this um, rejection of complexity and this weaponized simplicity results in a um, in a selection, really, for the simplest reality possible that we're exploring here, which is inevitably gravitates towards the white middle class men, right? And so the the cumulative effect of that is really a biomedical understanding of the human body that is made by and for white, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic bodies or democratic populations and those coming from those populations, given that you're not marginalized within that population, right? And that's depending on which um, which paper you're looking at that, that makes up about 12 to 20% of the world. Um, and here is one map of um, the distribution of studies. This is in psychology, but um, it sort of under, uh, illustrates the weird concept. And um, I would like to insert myself in the conversation of who gets to benefit from biomedical advancement, right? Because if you need to be within the, the colonial axis of power, the imperialist axis of power to benefit from um, biomedical research, then, well, I, I would ask you to take a look here in Northeast Brazil where you can find me, me, my sister, and my cousin. This this is us. These are the people who sort of aren't supposed to be benefiting from biomedical research, the way my grandmother never did, the way my mother fairly narrow, very narrowly escaped, right? And so I don't see this anymore as a conversation that's either about the mice or about the collateral damage of people. I see them as two sides of the same coin, right? Because what we do currently is we use market logic to, um, to perform uh, activities of active harm by means of medical animal experimentation, for example, epistemicide of other ways of knowing, and to enact passive harm. That is, we ignore health disparities, pollutions, and uh, validate the status quo because none of that is our field. We only need to find a marketable solution to whatever disease we are um, we are interested in researching. Um, and this one example that I hope not taking too too long, but I wanted to show to illustrate this in this one example of how biomedical scientists really sort of um, sort of do that in their way is really like you have this um, you have this problem. The problem is Humboldt penguins um, that are actually from South America, but Humboldt penguins have a very high, um, very high mortality rate in Belgium zoos, right? And then the biomedical scientist thinks, huh, why is that, right? Question, why do they die? But the chosen method is microsatellite poly polymorphism analysis. Therefore, you could never sort of address the point that they shouldn't be in those zoos in the first place, that they're the product of, um, that their oppression is, pro is a product of colonialism, the colonialist oppression, and the best route you would be to advocate for this to stop or for, you know, for better policies and so on. But you get to avoid all that as long as you stick to the microsatellite polymorph for polymorphism analysis, because then the conclusion is a fungus, right? Um, and so how, how do we, how do we avoid that? How do we avoid doing the, making the same mistakes of the past? Um, this right now is really just my opinion be, after being ignored over and over again is really like who are we listening to uh, who can participate how can we find ways to have more people be listened to and be participate and participate and who's been left behind how can we make sure we don't leave them behind and how can we reassess our priorities um and i think personally i think that this does involve a certain level of demanding and occupying spaces because those spaces are mostly occupied only by biomedical scientists and um, it's really easy to shut down any conversation about what's going wrong in it 
Um, and the approach I personally have been be have become a fan of is the subject as teacher also proposed in Braiding Sweetgrass by Kimmerer when she talks about a way of knowing complexity that sort of accepts it, embraces it, and approaches it with humility and respect with a sense of kinship and tries to learn from it rather than breaking it in its smallest pieces to try and discover something about it. Um, this is this one poem that at, in the beginning I sort of tried to put to put words to what I was saying when I didn't have the vocabulary. Unfortunately, in the interest of time, I'm going to have to skip it, but it's on my substack if anyone is interested. Um, and so in conclusion, I just like to to say, like my in my opinion, the way to move forward is to really assure that science does not repeat the mistakes of the past, not by reassigning animality to other groups, but by finding ways um, of knowing that treat animality with respect. Um, yeah, and this is my digital card. You can find all my socials and connections and everything you can have if you want. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marta. That was fascinating. I can really relate to a lot of the issues you raised. And I was interested in that map because some of the things you talked about in biomedical science are mirrored in conservation, which is what I'm studying. Um, and there's this problem called parachute science that you may have heard of. So people from the global north parachute to other countries in the global south, do their conservation, do their uh, objective science, and then go back to the global north. Um, so there are some parallels there, I think. So yeah, fascinating stuff. Um, I will have a quick look at the Padlet, unless anybody has a hand up. 